that go away. I hit video. Every now and then I do this right, and every now and then I do it wrong. What the hell are you looking at, Lee? All right, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Cut. There you go. <laughs> you stretching. Good morning, everybody. Good I morning. Apologize. apologize for being late. I was trying to get on, and my system sometimes screws up. You know, I'm, on, I'm still on that little uh, pay as you go. I have to put a quarter. You're not old enough to remember that, but I have to put a quarter. <laughs> Every 15 minutes, I have to put a quarter in my computer for it to work. Oh, Good, no. morning. Good morning. Good morning, brother. Thank you. But this is actually my assistant, Lee. How you doing? Um, when we're talking, he'll pop up like pictures. So he won't be on the main conversation, but like when we're talking, he'll have pictures popping up and stuff like that. We don't want him on in the first place. He ain't doing shit. <laughs> we don't need him. Well, no, that's, what I, that's what I keep telling myself when I write his paycheck. I'm like, this nigga ain't doing shit. What the fuck? Yo, why am I paying him? I'm going to go find, find the nearest bridge. You, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. You have to call him. You go, Ooh, that one time. That one, I got a guy working for me for 17 years. I don't know what the fuck he does. And I don't want to pay him. But every now and then, just that one time when I need his assistant, it's worth it. You know? It's worth it. He cut the dollar. He do a great job. Uh -huh. He's been working with me for about a month now, I think. A whole month? Old month, man. I had another yes, assistant, but uh, he didn't like working, so I had to, <laughs> I had to get him. So, hey, Justin, two people that does not like working, it's not going to work out, right? You <laughs> him, man. And the assistant, neither one of you want to work. That's amazing. <laughs> Straight up, I'm like, man, I'm the one that's supposed to not be working right now, not you. Um, well, we'll talk later. Let me know when you're ready to roll. Are we rolling? Yeah, we already rolling, man. We rolled into this thing. Let me tell you something, uh, Mr. Wallace. I got to call you Mr. Wallace. No, 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 no. Call you Dr. George, Doctor Wallace. Doctor Wallace, let's get. Don't, don't you feel better already talking to me? I do. I, that's what I do. I see all my patients at one time. I see them on time. Hey, I'm a regular doctor. So, Doctor Dr. Wallace. Wallace, let me tell you the reason why I created this platform, uh, because I wanted to celebrate people that I consider living legends and people that I feel like are making legendary moves out here. You are really the quintessential reason why I started this podcast. Um, somebody of your caliber and of the uh, of your nature, uh, somebody that's been in the game for for a long time, killing it forever since you came into the game. And so, yeah, it's really about hearing your journey. So, I, first of all, I just want to say thank you for even agreeing to do this, um, Doctor Wallace. <laughs> well, let me, Justin, let me say this. I want to thank you because it's such an honor to to uh, to be working with you. You know, I've been in, I've been doing comedy for forty four years, probably longer than you've been alive. Yes. <laughs> but to see young people on stage like you and me working with you on the same night we did the same show in Los Angeles, I think that's really dope right there, being able to go on stage. I've been doing it as long as you have, and I'm learning from you. I'm learning wow. from you young guys. So people wonder why, why is he still uh, in the business? Why is he still on the stage? Because I love it. It's my sex. It's my drugs. And you can learn from everybody. When I see you young guys and I go out on tour with like DC Young Fly and, and all of these people, it's like, I'm still in the game. I'm still handling it, you know? So it's it's really cool. And you still killing it. So the night that I met you, we did the Laugh Factory together, Chocolate Sundays. And I was like, oh shit, George Wallace is here. And, <laughs> and I went up, I went up and performed. I had a good set and you did nothing but was big, was complimentary of me and told me that you thought I was funny. That meant everything to me coming from somebody of, of your stature. So I appreciate that. Well, I, I am so honored to, to, to see that and see a young man that's coming up with the crap. Well, what you did on stage that night, there was a difference. Some people go on stage and you notice a difference. You go like, this guy has really got it. I love what he does. And I hadn't met you at the time, but I'm going, but I know him from somewhere. But I know him from somewhere. Then when you came off and we started talking, that's it. Fantastic, man. Thank you. And uh, let's continue doing this and making people happy. Absolutely, brother. So I want to go into like your whole background. Oh, well, you, well, first of all, somebody just told me, I didn't know if this was true or not. Somebody literally told me, I told them I was going to have you on the podcast and they were saying that you were working on, you were supposed to be doing Jamie Foxx's new show and then you, you left the show because of COVID. Is that true? That is true. I didn't leave the show. I just, they didn't give me enough time to come back. I wasn't prepared to go back yet. I am, um, I meet so many categories. I don't. I didn't want to fly at the time. Uh, the CDC ruling, you know, um, of age, and um, uh, I'm five pounds overweight. But I just not really. And let me tell you something. Netflix, they did everything they could to uh, appease me as far as health regulations and, and um, testing. People would be tested every day, and we would go home somewhat of a bubble. But LA is the hotbed 
of the uh, one of the hotbeds of the uh, COVID. So, but and you know when you do television, you got um, makeup, you got hair, you got uh, catering, you got uh, everybody on the set, and I just wasn't pre prepared for it. I'm still not prepared. I haven't gone to the clubs yet. Uh, God bless some of you young guys. You're young and you're going back out to the clubs already. Well. The next time you see me, if you see me in the, in the near future, I'll be uh, uh, wrapped in saran wrap because I'm not ready for it yet, you know. But but I, I really appreciate you guys going out there and starting coming again. I'll be back. And I've already done 100,000 shows, just So, you so, know. So you actually document, you count all the shows that you've done? I make up shit. That's all I do. I lie. <laughs> just made up some numbers. No, but I have. I've been doing it for 44 years. And pretty much, Justin, every night I've been on stage. I have wanted to be a comedian. I never wanted to be an actor or um, um, uh, on stage or in the film. I never thought about that. When I started coming in back in 1976, my best friend, Jerry Santo, you might have heard of him. We Legend. thought we, there were some guys in Las Vegas opening for Elvis Presley and, and Tom Jones and Don and also all these big set guys. We heard of Shecky Green, some of the old comedians, Don Rickles. They were doing lounge acts and they said, they make two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars a year. I I'm mean, a boy from Atlanta, Georgia, making two dollars an hour. What? The, that's all I need. Two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars a year, and all I ever wanted to do was be a comedian. I'm in the business because of uh, there's an older comedian you might not know of him, but it's Red Skelton. Oh, my dad told me about him. I seen some of his, his uh, old clips. Fantastic. Red Fox. There was another comedian named Red Buttons, and then there was another comedian named Pinky Lee. Now, as you notice, back in the day, all those are pillar, people of color, all red and pink. Those are people of color many years ago. <laughs> but, of course, but of course, Moms made believe and uh, uh, Flip Wilson and uh, Judge Pete Meek, Markham, Sammy Davis Jr., all of these people I used to just, when I grew up, if there was a black person on TV, we called everybody, everybody in Atlanta. There's a black man on there, no color. There's a color man on television. Watch him. So all of this comedy has been in my life forever. And I would take those jokes at the time as a kid here in Atlanta. I would take those jokes I heard on the Tonight Show that the comedians had done, and Richard Pryor and all this, I would take them back to school and I would do them in class and the kids would go crazy. They'd laugh. They thought you was the, the most brilliant comedian of all time. <laughs> They're like, he's, he's great. <laughs> Not necessarily like that because we didn't know about what a real comedian did back in the day. Gotcha. We, they just knew he was funny. I was not the class clown because I was too smart for that, but I was an instigator. I would get you into trouble. But not me, because I couldn't afford to get in trouble. My dad was president of the PTA. In wow. America. My daddy, George Wallace Sr., was the president of the PTA. You hear me? For the second grade education. How in the hell is he going to be president of the PTA? <laughs> <laughs> I guess the qualifications wasn't, wasn't that high. <laughs> well, he was a leader. He was a leader of the community, and he was a deacon in the church and all of that. And didn't read very well, but when it came came to raising money and making things happen, he got it done. And we were he was the he was the man of the neighborhood, little neighborhood out in, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, called Brookhaven. Yeah, you know, I went to Clark Atlanta University. I, that's where I graduated from. Is that right? Yeah. Man, let me tell you something. We're, we're talking more about Atlanta, but I'm born and raised here in Atlanta. And if you know anything about Atlanta, Lenox Square. Now, do you know that used to be a black neighborhood? No, nah, I didn't. Oh, yeah, Lenox Square used to be a black neighborhood. I was there the first day it opened. A little city called Johnsontown. And if you venture across the street over where Houston used to be and look at the back, you can go like, yeah, this used to be a neighborhood. A little na You can tell what the black neighborhoods used to be, gentrification, like when a highway goes through, and you can just look and go, oh, look at these empty spaces over here. Something used to be over here. So it used to be a black neighborhood, Lenox Square. And I was there the first day it opened. But that's where I'm born and raised and. Uh, Right across the line to Cab County. I don't know how I got on that subject, but uh, yeah. Nah, that's to, great. We're uh, talking about your father, man. So that, that's that's amazing. My mom is actually the area superintendent um, down in Florida, in Pinellas oh. County. So she's part of the- You from Pinellas whole... County? I'm from Pinellas County, yeah, yep. You from uh, St. Petersburg? St. Petersburg, yep. You old. <laughs> 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 no, I'm a I'm an old young nigga. <laughs> right. are, are you from like three three seven one two or something like that? Where you? From? I am man. Three three seven one one. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. You know that. 
I have property down there in that area. My aunts live down there, and I took over their property down in St. Petersburg. That's so great. That's and now it. I have property in Atlanta. I'm actually in Atlanta, too, right now. I got a house up here I have for corporate rentals, uh, and okay. I have an apartment for where I film a, a show called MacGyver out here. So I have an apartment. Yeah, I know. Here. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, yeah you, you just had to throw that in. I, I film a show <laughs> called MacGyver. Yeah, you, now you're bragging. Just, now hey, bragging. hey, so do you remember – your first time ever doing stand up because I had read that you dressed up like a pastor or a preacher, uh, Mr. Wright, Reverend, or something like that. But do you remember that that moment professionally? Yes, I was uh, because I'm from Georgia, as you know, being from St. Petersburg, uh, being a southern black kid, you grew up in the church and and uh, and uh, you go to church too much. Matter of fact, I could go to hell if I never go to church again in my life. I have put my time in off here. We had to go to church all day. I could just tell you about it. What was that lie I used to tell? We used to go to church on Sunday and we didn't get out until Tuesday. This shit was just way. So at the time, all I knew about was making fun of the preacher in the church. You know, when you're a kid and you get home, your mama have to say, shut up, boy. Yeah, he did say it, Ma. You know, he said it. he was telling a lie. You know, and I used to, a lot of things I didn't understand. I knew comedy in church, like simple things, like when the preacher used to say the doors of the church are open. My dumb ass would look back. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, they are. Somebody need to call them. No, 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 that's what I said. Them doors ain't open. <laughs> them doors ain't open. I used to I pick up comedy right there and just listen to the preacher. Uh, even to this day, when I go to church, and I love church. But you cannot say anything wrong. You cannot say anything uh, just, just not the truth. You know, and I pick up a lie. It's little things like every time the preacher tells everybody, please close your eyes in prayer. You might, you might close one of those eyes, but you ain't closing both of those eyes. I'm telling you, so you're lying. And like I said, my mama used to say to me in church, close your eyes, boy. And I go, always been a smart ass. She said, close your eyes, boy. And I go, how the hell you know? Close your own damn eyes, you know, in church. <laughs> so, so when I started out and I had like a comedy coach and he said, well, why don't you, why don't you do a preacher act, a character? So I put on a robe. And then I had on a cross on a big Jewish guy, a mixture of a high Jewish guy on a cross. And I had a big, thick Yellow Pages. Are you old enough to remember Yellow Pages from the phone company? I do. And I called it the Good Book of Bell. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you need, look it up in the book. Because the book was called what, Bell South? Yeah, it was, it was in the Bell Atlantic, wherever it was, but it was a big yellow book. So everybody, yeah. look, whatever you need, look it up in the book. You want some shoes? Whatever you need. It's in the book. So that was my first, the right Reverend Dr. George Wallace. And then I went into Reverend uh huh. And I had everybody go, uh huh. But that's how I started as a character. And you know, when you first start, you really don't know what you're doing. You're just getting into it. And I did that character for about two and a half years. And then I went out to the comedy store and I said, let me do my own thing. I took the robe off. I would have that as, a, I would bring him on as a guest, the right Reverend Dr. Wallace. And Absolutely. I started doing my own stand up and, uh, becoming me and so you know you really don't know who you are until about seven years when you have your personal point of view you know it's so funny i asked a comedian that the other day i had another comedian on uh, and i was telling him me personally it took me eight years to really find my voice as a stand-up comedian and you and you're saying it took you seven years to find your voice and every now and then we'll find somebody really 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 smart and sharp like a robin williams or uh um uh, uh, Kevin Hart, and, and, and they come through a little sooner. They yeah, Eddie it. Murphy. Uh, Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy, great example. Great example. Right. Coming about less than two years and just being at the right place at the right time. So that's what I have to teach the young comedians when you get in. Don't be jealous of anybody. You know, we have a lot of, a lot of young comedians out there that are jealous because they think they're funnier than the other guy. It's not who's the funniest. You just got to be at the right place at the right time. You know, it's, um, and then we're in a business where they only let maybe one or two black comedians reign at a time. So right, right. now it's Dave Chappelle and, 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 and Kevin. Uh, for a lady, forget about it. Always only one lady, one black lady. That's black and white. Tiffany Haddish is it right now. Right. Uh, uh, and the white side, it's really tough for black lady. See, we, we, came, we came up, uh, me and Tiffany, that we came up together. Who, who was in your circle? Who was in your class when you were coming up in the, in the early days of doing stand up? There were no black people when I come up. There was a few black people. There was only three black comedians, Steve Harper will tell you today, that would headline the white clubs. Uh, George Wallace, uh, um, Jimmy J.J. Walker, and Byron Allen. Wow. Otherwise, it was still a closed market. I just happened to have a, a personality that I could get through the door. 
uh, dealing with, uh, I guess, white audiences because I had tried out comedy uh, at college, just emceeing shows. I went to a school in uh, Akron, Ohio. 22,000 students. My wife's from Akron. <laughs> is that right? We got a lot of connections. Yeah, my wife, my, my wife's whole family is from Akron. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I might be your, I might be your wife's daddy. Uh, you. <laughs> you might be. Who knows? <laughs> well, I am. I am LeBron James's daddy. I know that for a fact. Oh well, hey man, let me get some of that money. I know y'all got it. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so going to school there, it was like I said, 22,000 students and only 200 black. So I became familiar in how to operate. I, never, I always had the personality. Growing up in Atlanta here, my parents always taught me to respect everybody and love everybody. And in Atlanta, we pretty much owned everything when I grew up in Atlanta. You know, we didn't have, we didn't depend on white people for shit. We had Auburn Avenue, Hunter Street, which you know, I'm on with the King. We, we had our black doctors, black lawyers. We did everything in black. As you know, as Atlanta today, that's why Atlanta is the Mecca. Absolutely. Today. Because of, Look at all of the leaders. They're, they're dying off now, but all of, everybody that came out of everything you need is in Atlanta. It's still black. It's yep. Killer Mike was saying, Atlanta, everybody knows this is it for black people. But growing up as a kid, it was it. Uh, wow. the, the progress, Dr. King, all of the, 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 uh, the leaders and the civil rights leaders were based out of Atlanta. I don't know why Atlanta has always been a good city. The reason probably is going back to Miss Daisy, like that movie, Miss Daisy. Blacks and Jews got together here in Atlanta. I think mm. in, uh, because they went through similar uh, experiences and blacks and Jews, black Jews had the money and blacks were the, in the numbers. So we came together here in Atlanta. So we learned so much being here. And uh, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. No, man, I was asking you about who is the, uh, some of the uh, comedians you started out with. And you were saying yeah. how it, it was no other black comedians. When it comes to the white comedians, how did, how did you and Jerry Seinfeld link up? How did that friendship begin? We were at a club in New York City, just starting 1976 in the month of June. He was a little Jewish kid at the end of the bar. He was, you know, when you're just starting, you don't know what's going on and you, you really don't know what's going on. You're just waiting for, just hoping to get on. You pick a number and then New York City, you might get on. Yeah, that's that idiot right there. He's such an <laughs> idiot. Uh, he already called me this morning. We're still best friends for 44 years, Justin. That's amazing. We still talk four or five times a day. I can't get rid of him. <laughs> That's amazing. Him. And uh, he's, um, he was there and a little Jewish boy on one end, a little black guy at the other end of the bar. We just started talking for some reason. God put us together. That is my best friend ever. And I wish everybody had a friend like Jerry Seinfeld. We've been together, you know, I was a, we were roommates for 13 years. Did you know that? No, I did not. For 13 years. That's, that's I'm real actually, pressure. I'm actually the real George on the show. I mean, that's crazy. Shared, <laughs> you know, we shared an apartment for, for 13 years. I was best man in his wedding. And once again, I'm the father of his kids. So, so. Uh, <laughs> but you, well, you are the godfather, right? I am the godfather. Yes, of course. And, and we're still friends today. So we met at the comedy club and we've been doing comedy together all these years. And do you know what, Justin? Do you know when we're in New York, we still get in the car and do two or three clubs a night? We go to Gotham, we go to Stand Up New York, we go to uh, Comic Strip. We still like going in, doing 20 minutes and getting up there, what we're supposed to do. Well, they let us do any, as not whatever we want to do, you know, but, but that's because you're working there and you made the clubs. And it's, it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure that we love comedy so much that we still do it. And you know, we make, a, uh, well, he make millions, he make almost billions of dollars. I do pretty good. And, um, but we still love, we, I've done a gig for $100,000 a night. And looking at my watch, can't wait to get off stage and run down to the laugh factory to do a free set. That's amazing. That's how much we love comedy. And you know, to go on stage, uh, he and I, uh, what we're going to do now, yesterday we decided what the apartment we used to share, guess what we decided? He's today going back to the city. We want to find that apartment. We're going to find the management. And whoever leaves when that, when that apartment becomes open again, we're going to buy it back. Nice. So it's a studio. It's a studio. Both of us lived in a studio. So we're going to buy it back. And we've just been friends all that time. And um, we both had fun. My goal was to become a successful comedian in las vegas his goal was to do television and 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 just be the best at television so y'all so both, both accomplish y'all both accomplish what y'all set out to do man i am so blessed i just i went to um 
Justin, I went to Las Vegas in 1979 with Diana Ross. And my name was on, I did the Tonight Show. I did the Tonight Show on a Thanksgiving night. On a and Thursday. I wanted to ask you about that. How was your first, was that your first Tonight Show? Yes, or sir. How was that experience? And did, did Johnny call you over to the couch afterwards? And if he didn't, how did you feel? My first night, it was a Thanksgiving night. I did the Tonight Show. I went in and it was, it's an, that was back in the day. If you did just Tonight Show, you already somebody just by doing the Tonight Show. Gotcha. Just by being on. I did the Tonight Show, dun, 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 dun. ladies and gentlemen, we got to come in the show right now. Uh, would you please welcome George Wallace? And I had to go out there and do the bit back in the day. We're talking back in, in 1977, something like that. And I just explain, first of all, George Wallace, me being from Georgia, had to tell everybody in America, wait, don't adjust your sets. Because I know everybody's <laughs> doing George Wallace, because we had the racist governor back at the time, right? So, but I did the set, and I did a good set. I mean, I was good. Now, as I look back on it today, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> compared, to, compared to the stunts then, I did good. Got you. But he, did, he gave me one of these. He did not call me over to the sofa. Later on, I found out he wasn't too particularly, he didn't care for us too much. Oh. So the racism, the racism was back then, and you don't notice it. My good friend Red Fox was number one on the and Son. I think the history is he never hosted the show on NBC. Now, there were a few blacks that did, uh, what do you call guest host every now and then? You had your Mr. Uh, Bill Cosby, because these are some of the end black people have been doing it for a while. You had your Samuel Davis Jr., some of the end black people for a while. You had your Flip Wilson, because he had an NBC show, so they push him in. But other blacks, pretty hard. I had a friend of mine named Shirley Hemphill. She was on a show called What's Happening? Mm -hmm. What's happening? Oh, what's was, happening? It was garage and all that. Hey, 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 the number one show in television. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> she was on TV one night on, on his show. I went with her. She was bumped. She was bumped for somebody less than. So she said, fuck Johnny Carson. Very loud. So, so he, she walked out. She said, I'll never come back to this fucking show. But at the time when you're young, you really don't understand systemic racism. So what's happening back then, and then later on we went on, we knew, I knew one of the, uh, Doc Sufferson was the band leader, and we knew his manager. And we got to know that Johnny wasn't too fond of us. He wouldn't put us on that much. Of course, when you got to your Richard Pryors, you got to your uh, Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy had the connection with the NBC. Uh, Eddie Murphy was just good. All of the, so he was that one guy, so he was a media star. Uh, uh, NBC, Saturday Night Live, and The Tonight Show. So. When you gotcha. went to the same network, they, they put you on automatically. But uh, doing the Tonight Show, but it was still good for me. I did that, like I said, if you got on the Tonight Show back in the day, I did the Tonight Show on a Thursday, Friday night. I was in front of 17,000 people with that opening for Natalie Cole. Oh so, my God. So man, just to, just to be out there doing jokes and still didn't know what I was doing. Still yeah, how many, how many years had you been doing stand up prior to your Tonight Show set? One and a half, didn't know shit, just. I had a personality where I could go out and just talk, hey, how y'all doing? Look at you, like that smile you got. It's something about, first of all, first of all, I was in, let me tell you this, I was a, um, vice president of the world's largest outdoor advertising agency. Did you know that in New York I, City? I didn't know that. Everything at Times Square, all of the billboards, all of the spectaculars, all of those lights, neon, everything going everywhere. I was vice president of that company back in 1970. Four seventy-five. So I was making money back then. I was making seventy-five thousand dollars a year back then. And back then. Eight, back then. And people say you're gonna quit. You're gonna quit. You're gonna quit making that money to be a comedian. I never even thought about. It. I wanted to be a comedian since I was six years old. I knew. I didn't. I didn't even think about money. I just. Who was that, that comedian that you saw that made you want to be a comedian? It was all of them. Uh, uh, Judge Picnic Markham, Sammy Davis Jr., Moms Mabley. Uh, okay. So many I people. Even, uh, I have to throw in Richard Pryor. I, I, once, like I said, the Red Skelton. Gotcha. Milton Burrow. These are these are heavy white guys, but they were just making people laugh. I wasn't listening, looking into color, anything like that. And then we had the party records too, Red Fox, that your mom would, uh, they had albums. Yeah. And, uh, and then they, they would go to church. They must have been stupid. They didn't think we were going to listen to those. <laughs> They call it party records, party records, X-rated jokes and things like that. Oh shit, we just listen to those and take them back to school and 
um, Wildman Steve, a lot of black comedians. And I said moms made me, uh, even uh, Aunt, uh, who was on the Tonight, who was on Red Fox show? Aunt, uh, Aunt Esther. All right. Aunt Esther. Yeah. Any and every comedian that would ever come on TV, I would watch them, black or white, as long as they're making people laugh. And I got into it, and I'm gonna take those jokes back to school. And then when I see happy people, it makes me happier. So I've been doing that all my life, Justin. And when you love what you do, uh, I have, I wrote a book, I wrote a book called Laugh It All. On page 62, it says, honor your essence. Honor your essence, and that means show people what you love to do. And I love to go out on stage and show people I love what I do. I'm the most blessed person, and you just go out and talk. And as you know, I go on and say, all I do is just lie. I just make up shit. I thank God every day. I just lie. As I said before, in my, one of my jokes in the last four years is going, I want to be the greatest bullshitter in the world. <laughs> but right now, Trump is kicking my ass in the bullshit department, man. He is kicking my ass. Like, so I just, I just honor my essence. I love what I do. And once again, I'm teaching the young kids now, just be you. There's a market for everybody. No matter what you do, there's a market for you. And, and there's enough money out there for everybody. That's why I love everybody, every comedian. And you may not even like this style, but they can put asses in the seats. Let me tell you something about you, how, how much of a vet you are. Even though I had a, a really good set that night at the Laugh Factory, you still got the biggest laughs that night. Make no mistake, he, 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 he's very humble. <laughs> and he was saying, singing my praises. Make no mistake, he still got the biggest laughs that night. I was like, that's what doing stand-up for 40 years gets you. Experience. I know, see, some kids don't know, well, I shouldn't say kids, but a lot of comedians to this day still don't know. If somebody in front of you, like you did, destroy the room, you better go up there and work off that energy. I know how to turn it around and go like he, like Justin was saying. Then wasn't that guy good? Blah, 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 blah. And he mentioned the such and such. And he mentioned the such and such. And the next thing you know, whoo, I screwed right into his little show. And then you pick up from there and you're right, you know, and, and, and when you've been doing it so long, you can, anybody do something or say something, I'm pretty much, I can just work off the cuff if I wanted to and just having fun. And, and then as I was saying, uh, talk about the young people, you guys got it made, some of the things you can do, some of the things that we couldn't do. And then I bring them together. Um, because being uh, of my age and still being on stage with you young guys is very different. You don't see too many of us out there, let alone doing the clubs. Right. No comedian might would go into the Laugh Factory and, 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 and still do a set because they'd rather just go to work. No, I got to try my shit out. And, you and, know and it shows, though. It, it shows because you're still... Yeah, I was going to ask you, what's your joke writing process? My joke writing process is to write down the subject matter and then take it from there. Now, my buddy Seinfeld, he will write out the entire joke. He will work a whole day, every day to this day, one hour on this. It's a legal pad. That's a, that's a yellow legal pad. If you don't write it on a legal pad, it's not legal. The jokes are not. You, well, when you write it out, my joke writing formula is to take the subject and just go with it. Like right now, we're talking about the changes. And I don't even know whether they're jokes, Jester. I'm just having fun. We're talking about the changes and when the, with, the, with the COVID, living with the COVID and, and what and how it's changed my life. It has changed my life so much. And of course, I blame Trump for everything. I want to write a book called How Trump Fucked Up My Life. <laughs> Yo, I will read that immediately. <laughs> hey, hey, Mr. Harris, let me tell you something. How, first of all, he lied to us. Now, we're, we're learning more. You know, he knew about the virus much sooner than he told us. So that's deceiving the American people. Um, uh, and so many more lives could have been saved. Okay, but what I'm saying, how he, how he fucked up my life. I don't go to church anymore. I don't, I, I love to travel. I'm one of the greatest, I, I'm normally, I do 250,000 miles a year traveling. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. I'm in my condo here in Atlanta right now. I've been here since March 24. I, uh, I call it being incarcerated on the lockdown. You call it a quarantine, uh, 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 isolated, isolation, whatever you want to call it. But he has screwed up my life tremendously. So relationships, you know, being a single person, you, you can't even go to the club anymore. So much you can't do. I can't visit my friends. My daughter came by to see me like the second week of the COVID and uh, she came out to visit me and I live on the 25th floor. I waved at her ass. 
<laughs> hey, baby, you stay your ass out there now. Close as you go, get, keep your ass moving, social distancing. You just so, looking at her through the blinds. Like. Yeah, so, so now, today, I'll be talking about so, much, so many things that are happening in the news. Oh, don't talk, don't, don't, you don't even want to know what's in my jokes for today. Now, I'm born and raised in Atlanta, right? Mm hmm I hope you didn't watch the Atlanta Falcons play football yesterday. I did. No, you didn't. Just lie to me and tell me. I you did not. You did not. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. I did I mean, not. It was so terrible. You know, and I have to go back. Sometimes things happen to me in my life. I have to go back to jokes that I did 20 years ago. Now I got to go. I got Like yesterday, I was talking about. I did a joke 20 years ago about watching the Atlanta Falcons play football. It's just like going to church. Because every time the Falcons get the ball, everybody in the stadium go, Jesus Christ! Yesterday, did you see the Atlanta Falcons sit there and just watch the ball in their face and then pound them? Three of them standing there. They were leading Dallas Cowboys by 20 points. Now, you live in Atlanta, and we got a brand new stadium over there. They call it the uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Mm -hmm. I want to change the name, and I did this joke uh, about five years ago. I want to change the name when the stadium first opened. We need to call that the Chick-fil-A Stadium because they both are closed on Sunday. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> they both are closed on Sunday. You're so, a sniper. You're a comedic sniper. <laughs> so when I start writing jokes, I write down premises, and, and then I just take them from there. I have my phone. I got uh, today... Uh, Today and so we'll, you write, you write every day, huh? Yeah, something comes out. I still have the yellow pad. I know you young kids still use the. Uh, yeah, I got the cell phone. But but it's it's a, that's your game. That's what you know. I remember more when I write it down on the pad. But you Even know what I, I you know what I do do actually uh, other than do do what you do do. Well, I'll you, tell you what I do do. Uh, what you do do. I, I listen to every set. I record every set when I get yeah. home. I uh, write it, I do transcribe it on paper because I, I memorize it. So I have a notebook and I transcribe everything and then I actually carry my notebook to the comedy clubs. Oh, that's good. So like I have like probably two or 300 of these legal pads. Seinfeld has the same. Now his next, his next special, he's gonna have all his jokes out on the street. All of his paper just covering the whole street of what he's written up over the years. Oh, so when you, when you write it down, it's in your head better. Um, see, right now I got down here, uh, I got in my phone here, I got these blue glasses that people are wearing. All of a sudden, when it, all of a sudden people are wearing all these blue goddamn glasses. What the hell? I don't have anything funny on it right now, but something will come out of it, you know? Uh, maybe, I know Al Roker used to do Al. <laughs> Al you'll watch Al Roker in the morning. You're just so happy. <laughs> And then he says, and here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. And then, you know, I'm thinking, now, when did wood start having body parts? Here's <laughs> that, your neck of the woods. And then I take that and I try to make that in a joke. I guess there's certain things, you know, like the shoulder of the road, okay, the mouth of the river. And you try to bring all these things together and try to make it a joke eventually. So eventually that will become a joke. Do, do you and Seinfeld tag each other's jokes? Hell Yeah. <laughs> That's all we do. You know, he's doing something. He's talking about a bit on old people now because when you get old, and we both got the same goddamn bits. Because <laughs> y'all be around each other so much. Because so we, well, we have the same bits, and he'll do a bit, and I'll do the same bit. And I said, you know, I got that bit right. Like the Flex Hill Man. I'm doing the Flex Hill Man. Next thing I know, he's trying to say, you know, that's my bit, right? It doesn't <laughs> matter. It doesn't matter. And I can't say anything because he helps me more than I help him, to be honest, and tagging and putting some of these jokes together. And, uh, so yeah, we tag all the time. He was doing a bit about an old person because they don't have to give a shit anymore. And he was talking, especially the old Jewish man. I said, yeah, and do this at the end. An old person, you could just say something and be pissed off. They won't even say anything to you. They just look at you and go. Well, that's, that's exactly, I was just about to say that about Seinfeld, which is what I love about him is he don't care about anything. He's just like, I'm listening. There you go. <laughs> you get to the point where you don't give a shit. That's what I'm saying. I don't give a shit anymore. That's when I, you know, I'm, I, I have a new bit on Twitter called I'm a rebel. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. I, I'll, I, I'll, uh, I'll eat pancakes out of a cup and cupcakes out of a pan. I don't give a shit. You understand what I'm saying? I'll drink a half a glass of whole milk and a whole glass of half and half. I don't give a shit. 
a lady said to me in the audience one night, Mr. Wallace, you know, my show is kind of open. People would shout out all 3,000 people from the back, Mr. Wallace. She says, Mr. Wallace, you might drink a half a glass of whole milk and a whole glass of half and half. You may not give a shit, but you're going to take one. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a rebel. So when you get to the point where you don't, that's when you're really giving your point of view. You really, you know, like my point of view getting old. I don't like company anymore. I don't like company more. People come to my house, first thing I ask them, where you staying? Straight up. Stay? Yeah, where you staying? Exactly. Check in at the hotel, whatever. I'm gonna, I just built a brand new 12,000 square foot home in Atlanta, Georgia. 12,000 square feet, Ooh. one bedroom. <laughs> one bedroom. You got more than one bedroom, you got company. Well, what's, what's in the other room? What's, what's the other room? <laughs> so just, 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 just space, everything else, but ain't no bedroom. Man. Take your ass to the hotel. You got couches in every room. <laughs> <laughs> Bowling alleys. Hey, oh, yeah. I want to get back to that Diana Ross story. How was it opening for Diana Ross? Okay, so let's take it from this point of view. Like I said, I did the Tonight Show. The next night I was opening with Natalie Cole. This will be, she had all of those big hits, right? And then I left her and I went to George Benson. So I'm learning how to be, and I'm the only black comedian at the time opening for all of these people. I left George Benson, I went with Helen Reddy, black and white, Perry Como, Smokey Robinson. Then all of a sudden the agency says to me after George Benson, Diana Ross. <sighs> and that was back in the day, when the heyday, disco, 1980, oh, 1979 was the actual year I started with her. Disco, she was the queen, Miss Ross. Just got a divorce from Barry Gordon, so she's going through a lot, but she's actually the queen, and I'm telling you, her audience is, you know, I'm working in front of 17, 18,000 people every night. And then I'm working in Las Vegas in front of 1,300 people, sold out crowds in the casino showrooms. And you had to have a jacket to even get in the showroom. I would watch Miss Ross every night, learning showmanship. She would come out every night and I would say, I'm coming, I'm coming out. You know that song? That mm -hmm. hit? She would sing that song coming out and you get goosebumps, just chills. Watching her come out, I'm just, oh my God, look at that. Every night I would watch her and I, she would sing that song, I'm Coming Out. And at the time, did you know that when they wrote that song for her, she didn't know that the guys, it was kind of like a gay song, I'm Coming Out? <laughs> it makes sense now. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, right? She just thought, she thought it meant, I'm coming out on the stage, you know? And they had said that that song would never hit the, hit the charts. Hmm. One of that, those guys were writing for her and Upside Down, boy, you're telling me, I was watching her, she was doing, man, it was amazing to learn showmanship. That's why I watch you on stage as young as you are. You learn something from everybody. She would go out there and she would watch the audiences and the people would love her. Reach out and touch somebody's hand down the Ross. And in the meantime, I'm making jokes. I'm going, you don't be reaching out and touching nobody's nasty ass hands. You don't know where these people's hands have been, shit. Y'all don't, don't know where my hands have been, do you? I know where they've been. They're going to be back there as soon as I get back up to my room. So, you know, so you pick <laughs> so you pick up little jokes like that. You just have fun. So I did Diana Ross for, for a year and a half. How, how tough was that crowd originally? Because that's something that's kind of a lost art form when it comes to comedians opening, opening up for musicians. That's not really a thing anymore. So no. how, how tough was that, or if it was tough, when you first started opening for Diana Ross? Good question, Justin. Good question. You know why it's a good question? Because those people coming to see Diana Ross, they didn't come see George Wallace. They weren't coming to see George Wallace. Who the hell is he? I, I see comedians back in the day opening acts were time to stall. They used to, say, mm -hmm. they used to call us settlement comedians. You're on stage while they're backstage getting their money. Oh, they go gotcha. Are they, <laughs> they settling, were, getting their money, they, you on stage? Yeah, yeah, okay, now you get off stage now. And then they also had uh, dinner shows back then. People were eating while we were on stage. And, uh, but what the exception is, if you, you've seen a pleasant surprise before. Yeah. George Wallace, I can say it was a pleasant surprise. Why? Because I honored my essence. I love what I do. People are not gonna let you laugh alone with this medicine. Oh, this guy's good. This guy's good. This guy's good. Left down a Ross. Uh, they called me for Tom Jones. Now, you might not know. What's new, pussycat? Whoa! This guy is an international star, but I'm with Dan Ross. And they asked me to come work for him. I'm going, hell no, I'm working with 17,000, 18,000 people every night. I ain't going nowhere. 
So Diana Ross had a, a vacation summer break and uh, the agency of William Morris back at the time. We worked with Tom Jones over there for a while. I said, I got nothing else to do. Uh, Tom Jones, the Tom Jones, he was a big superstar back in the day and had shows like a Shea Stadium and all of the ladies loved him because he had a big crotch. He showed, he showed his big pack, he showed his jump. White guy oh, I, I did hear you correctly. You said he had a big crotch. I was like, I don't know if I heard that. I thought, I was like, maybe he said crowd. But no, you said his dick was big. That's what you're saying. That's, <laughs> we're not sure. Okay. Big, but but it would show. And the ladies, black ladies, white ladies, everybody would love him. And then uh, people say, George Wallace, Tom Jones got socks in his pants? I said, yeah, you got a couple of pairs of shoes in there too because we became very good friends. But this guy, Justin, this guy is so big. I worked with him the first night. Oh, you said, wait a minute, you said he's so big as a star, not his dick was so big. That's what oh, you're so fucking stupid. You know what? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to get clarification. But, but, all right. know, but you, if you went to the show, you can help but to see. Because back, oh, no, no listen, Justin, let me make this perfectly clear. Back in the 80s, everybody showed their jump. They, 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 that, that, was a, that was the style back then. You and tight pants and you show your, yeah, you show your balls and stuff. <laughs> there we go. No. <laughs> hey, shout out to Leo. Funny, it was funny and shit. No, but it was worse than that, Justin. It was so good. That was your job when you went to the beach and you went to the nightclub, Studio 54. Show your shit. You should bring your pants up and show your shit, you know? I did it. And I, <laughs> I would too if I was in the around in the 80s. Oh. And, back, and everybody dressed back then. So Tom Jones, I worked with him for five and a half years, opening for him. Wow. Uh, Diana Ross and uh, George Benson and Natalie Cole, all these stars, superstars I was opening for, you had to go out and do 20 minutes. Tom Jones made me do 45 minutes every night in front of him. And then Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas, so we had two shows a night, nine o'clock show, dinner show, midnight show, cocktail show, uh, on the road, 20 minutes. That's a long time. So, and they told me when I worked with Tom Jones that, Mr. Wallace, the first 500 she seats down front, these are the Tom Jones ladies, these are their fans. They come see him every night. It was a cult. They came see him every night. So don't be surprised if the seats are not open because they don't come, they come to see Tom Jones. Do you know what those ladies did? They came every night for five years all over America. They would come to see George Wallace. They would support me. They start throwing their pantyhose on the stage to me. Hey, okay. I would go, eat your heart out, Tom Jones. So all of a sudden, we become a family. So doing 45 minutes and two shows a night, I also learned very quickly. I got to get a lot of material in here and learn how to do new material so these people won't see the same act every night. So that taught me how to prepare for a show in Las Vegas. Um, how did you get your residency in Las Vegas? How did that start? I'm going to get to that. So we did, you were talking about how was it working with Diana Ross. And oh, Diana yeah. Ross at the time. Her audiences back in the day, Studio 54, was 50% gay. 50% gay. She got Let the coming you, out song, so, you know. If you're, working, if you're working in front of, you may not have experienced this yet. Uh, times have changed. But if you're working in front of a gay audience, or a black audience, or a Jewish audience, when they love you, they're going to show you some love. So I was getting standing ovation. The, you know, the worst audience in the world is all black audience. They will tell your ass up if you ain't ready. I just, <laughs> told my, I just told my assistant that the other night, because we was at a club, and he was like, it seemed like the black crowd is the easiest. I said, no, bro. The black crowd <laughs> is the hardest. The hardest crowd ever. They will tell your ass up, and people say, you have a heckler. Now, if you have a heckler, I might be wrong on this, Justin. If you have a heckler. I think the comedian has given cause for some space in there for a heckler to get into your material. I could be wrong, but you sh should be so prepared that nobody should want to interfere with your progress on stage, uh, with your timing. But I've seen people a little slow and they go, uh, you know, like, okay, all right, what else? And all of a sudden, there's always some guy in the audience that he's smarter than you before the show even starts. So you gotta be ready to roll. You got a guy like me to come out to real hard school, you know, anywhere in my shows. How about your ugly ass mama, George Wallace? So now I got to deal with that. I'm trying, I'm trying to get away from it, but they won't let me get away from it because, you know, back in the day with our city hall, I was the king of the your mama joke. It could go for 25, 30 minutes, man. It could go for 25, 30 minutes. Just talking about each other's mama. Yeah, I buy them your mama, you know, just, and I, I knew them all. I don't know them all now, but I could just make up shit if I want to. 
like my good friend J. Anthony Brown on Steve Harvey Morning Show. Love J. Anthony Brown. He gave me, he was the first comedy club that let me perform every night in LA. Is that right? Absolutely. So you must be good. See, he's, he's really cool. I did that little J. Spot. I helped him open the club and like that. But, but to this day, he still talks about my mama. And we say stuff that's so nasty, like his mama, you know, uh, right now, well, she just, I went Christmas shopping for her last year and, uh, and I found out she likes sporting good, outdoor sporting. So I went down to the sporting store. It's a big sporting store. She loves it. It's, a, uh, it's Rick's. Is it Rick's? 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 Rick's is a sporting goods store. I know you're talking about. Mm -hmm. What's it called? I thought it was Vicks, but I don't know. No, Dicks. Dicks. That's what, that is Dicks. No, we, we were close. I was trying to set you up to say Dicks. Oh, okay. Dicks. We should have just called it the Tom Jones. We but... love Dicks. <laughs> you be thinking should have just called it Tom Jones. And she loved Dicks. If you want to get his mama anything, you just just go down to Dicks. Anything with Dicks. <laughs> so, so we. <laughs> You, we used to do, do those jokes, you know, and it was just so good. And tell your mama, and when you get home, Jay, tell your mama they caught that rapist so she can stop sleeping naked at night with the window open. I used to do all kind of crazy jokes like that. And so, but you just got to be prepared when you go on stage. You have that Diana Ross audience and the, and the black audience, just fantastic. And then you learn how to work any audience. Now, and I do, I'm pretty blessed or prepared or ready or worked hard to do corporate uh, audiences. Some people can't do corporate. That's when you gotta go out and be very clean and don't say anything political. You just gotta be, and it's gotten really worse now. It's gotten worse. I'm about to say, I, why, why do they, why do they uh, want the comedians to be clean? I can understand not saying anything politically uh, incorrect, I, I, I guess, but the, the clean aspect, why do you think that's a thing? It's just something from history. And traditional, don't be, don't say anything, don't piss anybody off. You got a lot of somebody may be religious, whatever the reason is, just be, just do clean act. You know, Seinfeld pretty much does clean act and don't refer to body parts, don't get into uh, politics, you know, because now you get into politics, you pissed off the, the Trump people, you pissed off the Democrats. And I have some way, uh, if it's a really big money, I won't do any political stuff, but at my show, I'm tell I don't do I don't do political jokes at my show. I don't do no Trump jokes. I tell people I don't do no Trump jokes uh, because uh, I don't I don't have to. But if I did do a Trump joke, I would say you know because I could just say shit he said. The next thing you know, thirty minutes I'm talking about Trump's ass for thirty. Minutes. <laughs> All you gotta do is read his tweets. Yeah, just 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 read his tweets and go in there and and some I just say shit he said. Like he said, uh, uh, what do we have to lose? We got every damn thing to lose, and you're just going to it. Didn't he say, uh, what do you have to lose? Vote for me? And I said, and to this day, this is the joke I used to do. I might remember to do it when I get back on stage. To this day, not one black person in this cabinet, not one black person, somebody in the audience would shut up. How about Ben Carson? He ain't one of us. What the hell are you talking about? Now, you know, I'm on that for 10 minutes, talking about Ben Carson. Now, now in the cabinet, now, yesterday, I'm worrying about no black people in the cabinet. You got Ben Carson. You got a guy named Dr. Jerome something. He's a Surgeon General. You don't hear about them black people too much, do you? No. I think Ben Carson died. Didn't he die from COVID? No, that's that's the guy in Atlanta. That's Herman Cain. Oh, okay. One nigga, two nigga, three nigga, four. They all the same. All right. <laughs> ben Carson, he's a, he's a, ben Carson, he's the uh, he's a hood, Secretary of Hood. Oh, so okay. I said, <laughs> I said, Trump is so fucking stupid. They asked him where he came from. They said, well, Ben Carson came from the hood. Trump dumped an ass. Well, put him back in charge of the hood. H-U-D. You know, so, <laughs> but, yeah. so when you get into politics, you just really not piss off the people. Because you can make a lot of money when they know you're in corporate, working for McDonald's and working for uh, all of these big corporate companies and doctors' organizations. So you learn how to do it all. I do. No, I mean, clear, clearly, you're, you're, you're a master of the, of the art form, for, for sure. Wh when did the acting start to come into play in your career? Man, they just called me. They just called me. And Jamie wanted me to be, it was a good, it's a great show. It's called Daddy Stop Embarrassing Me. It's about Jamie Foxx's life. I'm his daddy and his daughter and everybody in his family lives in his house. It's a true story. So we're all freeloaders. So it was Jamie's life. And he says, Georgia, you've got to come be my daddy. Come be my daddy. So I went to, and the show was rolling well. And then we got hit by COVID-19 uh, uh, on the 14th of March and they shut it down. And, um, like I said, I'm just not ready yet to go back. 
Yeah, not even that though. I, I mean, like, um, like when you first started like acting in films and, and those and those type roles. Like, who who was like the first person that gave you a shot to act in in a movie? It was Cheech and Chong called "Things Are Tough All Over." They saw me on stage, come down. And I was I played the champ at the time. I was like a homeless guy uh, with Cheech and Chong smoking uh, weed and. And I was giving out, giving out, I was acting like Muhammad Ali. And when I started, I was so stupid. I know nothing about film, uh, Justin. I, I looked dead into the camera. I was looking, <laughs> I said, Stop looking in the camera. And then I, I learned. See, when you're starting off, a lot, a lot of things you have to learn. And just be natural. You know, now I know they're picking up everything you do. Just be natural. So I started with things are tough all over, all over and I went into other little, I think I've done about 40 movies and little bits in there and here and there. Uh, You've done a lot, man. You were, tell me about, um, well, tell me one of, one of your classic roles is uh, the movie, The Wash. Wash, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell me how that came about. They called me, DJ Pugh loves me. He's never done a movie without me. Look, <laughs> <laughs> those two guys were great and we had so much fun there. And uh, like I was new, th those, they were the stars. But had I done a movie, I told them, said, Y'all need to promote me in this movie so I can get out and go do the television and help promote it to make it. Uh, and you know, when it was when it first came out, it was just so so, and it caught on, and they still run it to this day. I'm still getting checks from the watch every week. I get a check from the watch, four dollars eighty three cents. Four dollars eighty three cents. What two dollars eighty three cents? I know about that. I, I I did a few spots on a show called Key and Peel, and uh, I literally have gotten a two cent check. I'm That's not even joking. I swear to God, it, was, it cost them more to send the check out than the checks were. And I and I cash it just to make sure that they have to pay more money. Just <laughs> hey, me too. I, my, like my mama always say that's two cents more than you had. And sometimes I keep them. So you need to keep them so you can show the people, look at this check they sent me. So right. I'm going to keep the next one. Yeah, keep the next one, even if it's 43 cents. But yeah, hey. doing the movies I did, uh, I did so many and I've done so many. And, uh, and DJ Pooh and I, we want to do the wash again right now. Sure. And we want to bring in people like uh, uh, young comedians, like there's a young comedian out there like Justin Hires. You probably <laughs> never heard of him. But we want to bring in people like that. We want to mix the crowd up. Some of the older people that was in the first wash that are still around, we want to put them in the movie, still working there. I own the place, put some of the younger people in there, Mike Epps, and then we get the younger guys like you and Tiffany. And, uh, and it's just a come together movie. You, you, you saw how many entertainers were in the, those both uh, movies of the wash the wash and and car wash yeah it'd be nice to come with the music du, 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 du. I, mean, no, that's the box. I love wash. it man I, let me tell you something i would definitely be down for that it's so funny i just watched i just uh i wrote because i write also and i wrote um half baked two for universal okay. i don't know yeah. if you remember the original with Chappelle. Yes. So, I don't know who's starring in it. I'm trying to actually get a role in a movie that I wrote. It's so ridiculous that I even have to like you're to, you're to get, that, that you wrote. You're trying to get a role, a role in it. Ain't that some it, shit? Guess what? Me too. I'm trying to get in. <laughs> but yeah, movies are fun. I love it. I, I've done a lot. I've done more work uh, this year. Last year, I did so much shit, man. It's just I'm working my ass off, and I'm still uh, working. Now let's get back to the point. I worked so hard. I said, okay. Uh, my residency in Las Vegas. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> After working, uh, so I ain't completely lost it. You know. <laughs> After working uh, probably 15 years on the road, I said, well, let me go do my own thing. I'm going to go out and reinvent the brand. So I went out to every comedy club in America, every comedy club in America, building the brand back up, being on the Tom Jordan Morning Show, being on the Steve Harvey Show, being on my own show in Chicago, uh, WGCI, in New York City, I did radio. So I had fans on radio, television, and the movies. So uh, I want to build my own brand. I did every comedy club and sold out everywhere. Then I started a tour with me and Dan Vitter Brown and, and uh, 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 quite a few other comedians. And, and I was selling out to Atlanta Civic Arena. And we're doing two shows a night. And some night, I was still getting cheated, but I was making as much as $129,000 a night for these, for these arenas. And, and, and I was promoting the show and on the show, and I was learning. Walter Latham, the guy that produced the guy, uh, uh, Kings of Comedy. Absolutely. He, I, he was my executive uh, promoter. He says, you're going to learn everything and fire me, aren't you? My dumb ass says, yep. <laughs> and I fired him. 
And the show started to go down after that. Now, what you need to learn when you're young is do what you do. You're not a promoter. He's in the promoting business. You need help sometime. He knew how to promote more than I did. All I know how to do is tell jokes and write checks. So when you don't work with a promoter and you're going to a territory, they can shoot you down like you won't believe. They know people. It's like doing these concerts that we do now. You see us all on these big concerts, Mike and, and uh, Samoa and me and, and Chris Tucker and, 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 and uh, what's his name in the morning? Uh, Ricky Smiley. Ricky Smiley, all of us on the same show. These guys have a connection with the agents and with the owners of the venues. If you go against them, they have a way of cutting you down. So when I said I'm gonna start producing my own comedy shows at these arenas, all of a sudden my ticket sales go nowhere and people say, we wanna come, but the show is sold out. Well, what the fuck you mean sold out? We got another 5,000 seats to sell, what are you talking about? They get together, they know each other, it's like a system. They can talk to each other, put down in the show in the system. Ticket masters, sold out. Any kind of way, they can block you. So I'm not saying he did that, but I did need his help. I'm sorry to this day that I didn't let him continue to promote, promote my shows. Because he, he could have turned it into uh, uh, Kings of Comedy back then. We were the first one to go out there and do those shows. And, but you know, when you find out little things like uh, they have ways of taking money from you, you know, they were charging me $25. 25, 25 cents for every head that came into the arena. 25 cents for insurance. 25 cents per head. So you're gonna go, damn, $3,000 just for insurance each night? And at the time when, when I uh, was learning, I didn't know you could buy an insurance policy for the whole year for every show you do. Mm. So that was like money, just like an extra two or $300,000 just going toward a system, a cheap system that they could make money. And I could just buy one insurance policy. You learn as you go. I'm sorry. So my point I'm making here is that it's not only show. It's a business. Absolutely. Now, what, what made you fi fire Walter? Was it the fact he was, it was the, that you had to cut him a check and you was like, I, I could save that money? You went out there. Uh, you went out. Is that me or you? Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. I can hear so what, I didn't fire him. I just started doing my own shows. Okay. Uh, uh, this is the worst thing. I, I thought I knew everything, Mr. Smartass, because I, I do get things done when I want to do it. And let me just say this. I was successful at it, but I could have been better off had I stuck with him. Okay, when I got to Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, doing my own show, George Wallace coming in, and I worked for a producer there for three months. He wasn't doing the right thing, promoting right. Because if there was anything I knew about advertising and putting your business in the street, so we wasn't making any money. I said, well, let me take over this damn thing at the Flamingo Hotel, 800 seats every night. So it started off a little slow and it started to build 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And the president of the hotel came to me and says, you ain't going nowhere. Because you know what I did? My system was that I'm gonna go to every concierge in every hotel in the city and shake their hand and let them know that there's a show in Las Vegas. And it had nothing to do with being an African-American, but being the only African-American and all of the African-American people coming to Las Vegas knew me from the Tom John the Morning Show, they knew me from uh, Arsenio Hall and all of the black shows that, and being the only one. And I got in there um, and the next thing you know, 90 days, one year, three years, I was there for 10 years at the Flamingo. And I did not work for the hotel, I owned the show. Wow. I rented the room out, that's called Four Wall and you do everything. I do the marketing, I do the advertising, I do the directing, lighting, I had 26 people working for me every night and I had People coming in the room from everywhere. George show was George Wallace show, fresh and different because I didn't know what was happening. Everybody would come to my show from Aretha Franklin, got up on the start stage and say, Tom Jones, the man with the big <laughs> ladies go crazy over him. I had a group called War, they opened for me. Uh, uh, there's a group called Sly and the Family Stone. Wow. And on stage in 25 years, they came and worked for me. And I'm smart enough to know I'm opening tonight, they're closing and the show would be different all the time. I mean, you don't know what was gonna happen at the show because I was crazy, man. I was giving away trips around the world. I was giving away just, it was like a variety show. And I had all of the singers, people just having fun and, and I, I made a lot of money. And I was thank God every night for people like Red Fox, Simon Davis Jr. and Lena Horne for paving a way for me to come in and work a show like The Flamingo. And I used to tell the people I honor them so much because 
they worked here and they can even come through the front door to work this very stage that I'm standing on. I thank God for them for opening up a pavement and way for me because they had to go through the kitchen to come out and work on this thing. And I said, if they were alive today, Red Fox, Peter Horn, Simon Davis, you're there, if they were alive today, they'd be surprised, wouldn't they? And the owners go, yes, they would. Yeah, you have to know, we're still going through that same damn kitchen. You know, the entertainers, they still got to go through the kitchen, no matter who you are, we still got to go through the kitchen. But man, what an honor it is. And I, and I left Las Vegas, I did that for 10 years. My best friend Seinfeld walked out on stage one night with me and he said, all right, we've been here 10 years, we're out of here. What he made said, you, what made you end the, the, the show? Well, I had, it was time to reinvent the brand again because I didn't know kids like you. I had to go out and, and get a new market of young people. Plus, uh, our business sense was like, you know, he stopped this show after nine years. Do something new, get into something new. And I had accomplished my goal. My goal was to work Las Vegas. And then they gave me the title of the new Mr. Las Vegas. Mm, that's right. The new Mr. Las Vegas. So I had worked as, okay, let's get back out. Let's get back into these movies and just just for the awareness. I never wanted to be any superstar or anything like that. Never just I just want to work. And and I'm the today I am the most successful entertainer you have ever met. People don't understand when I when I say that. It's not how much money you make, it's how you enjoy your life while you're living. Mm. So I've lived and worked so long, I got enough money, I could retire tomorrow. I won't ever have to work again in my life. I can do anything I want to do. I got. I bought real estate all over the world. Uh, I, I'm just in a good position. Hey, it's talk about that because I feel like that's something that enough people don't know about. I mean, like, like I said, I, I I bought a house out here and it's just for corporate rentals. I don't even live in it. What made you start doing that? Because I think it's important for people to know, like, uh, rap, like rappers. You know, they go buying all these cars and jewelry, and it's like maybe y'all should go buy a house or some property or some land. Yeah. And buy some property. Ooh, if you buy some land, as the old folks say, they don't make that anymore. Right. So you got to be smart. So I bought a lot. I have like, I just bought, I don't do drugs. So I never did drugs. So I didn't get caught up in that. So I said, uh, I'm going to do real estate. So I went and, and then once again, um, I bought my first house in Los Angeles. And then I was making good money on the road. And that was New York City. I bought a place in New York City to this day. I went into a place in Seinfeld. Sometimes people got to teach you how to live and move up another level. I bought a place on Central Park West. I don't know whether you know what that is. It's in it's New York. On, uh, New York City, Central Park West, 72nd Street, right across the street from where John Lennon, John Lennon was shot at the Dakota. Mm -hmm. I tell people I live in a safe neighborhood. I live across the street from where John Lennon was shot. So, so but I bought a place there back in 1998, top floor. When we went out and looked at the place, I got 19 windows. You look all over the city. I can see Jersey, Connecticut. I can I have one of the best views in New York City. And I went up there and the lady told me how much it was. It was so beautiful. I just told Seinfeld, you know, when you're bullshitting with the real estate agent, just, oh yeah, this is nice. I had never seen anything like that in my life. 19 windows just all across, all across the city. And uh and I took Seinfeld up that night and they knew who he was, but when we walked downstairs, he said, you have got to buy that place. I said, like, you fucking crazy. You know how much that place is? He says, we have the money. That's friendship. That's a good friend, right? Ooh. We have the money. Well, at the time I learned how to do it, I didn't need his money, but I did have the assurance that if I did need it, it was there. Mm. It was there. But I'm glad I bought it. Now, the reason I said that to say this is because real estate grows. Now, that was back in 1998. Now it's 2000 already. And the place is probably, you know how real estate has gone crazy. Absolutely, I mean, probably crazy, doubled. Crazy, crazy, crazy. What? I said, say probably, double? Yeah, I said it probably doubled. How, how much crazy? is worth? New York City? What you thinking? Oh, I'm thinking 10 times. Oh, I'm sure. I mean. Yeah, because it's in a prime place in New York City. Uh, you, would, you, you can't imagine the views is uh, amazing. They got the best views in the city. I can see all the rivers. New Jersey, New York, Kennedy Airport, but I bought real estate here in Atlanta. I bought real estate down on Lake Okuni. I just started buying and all of a sudden it was available. You know, you find these good deals and you went through the economic crunch. Uh, 2008, I bought condos in Las Vegas. I just started buying it. And next thing you know, right now, I got to get rid of some shit. I got too much property out there. I got to get rid of this stuff. 
Hey, I might buy up some of your shit. I, shit I'm going to holler at you one of these days. Do yourself a favor. You were thinking right at the first moment, you meant like, some of these rappers, they go out and they buy all of this shit. They buy all of these cars. I got a friend that lives in Las Vegas. His name is Mike Tyson. Yeah, oh, absolutely. $300 million. Let me ask you a question. Now, I'm a good, good, good Christian in the church, okay? I know the bishop and everything. But how the fuck do you lose $300 million? Justin, listen, being stupid, I could have, who the fuck need five Rolls Royces at one time, Justin? Nobody. See, and you see these guys, are, also you gotta, when you're young, you think crazy. And you see, even buying houses, it's okay to buy a house at a time, but don't, sometimes you see such and such built a house with 12,000, 15,000 square feet. And the next thing you know, they're making a lot of money as a ball player. And then after five years or six years and the money not coming in anymore, but the bills are still coming in. Mm -hmm. So you got to, like I said, it's business. You really, you really got to regulate yourself and know what you're doing. And then who the hell needs 15,000 square feet? You walk around. I've never been in that part of the house. So next thing you know, so start thinking in the future, just enough room for you and, 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 and don't go broke doing it because taxes are high as hell, man. That's what I'm seeing. <laughs> Property tax. Property tax. When nothing is coming in and property tax is still coming in, you got that. And when you buy houses, shit break down, all kinds of things. It's so much. So know, know who you are. Know where you are. Hey, have you been in Eddie Murphy's house? Because he just posted a video, him standing in his... This is the biggest hallway I've ever seen in my life, man. <laughs> he just won an Emmy and did his acceptance speech like in a hallway in his house. And I'm thinking, holy shit, this nigga lives in a castle. <laughs> They do live in a castle, but he's got the kind of money that he can get that sustain. You know, he's in he's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. I think it's a hundred million dollars. Yeah. Have you so, been in there? I have not been in there. So when you do that and you put your money in the bank, you can make money off your interest off a hundred million dollars. You ever have to do anything. It, like Dave Chappelle, let's go back to what Dave Chappelle said. If you ever get to the point where you got $10 million and you know how to uh, supply yourself, that could take who when they have the $50 million. He said at the time, who the fuck, you, what are you going to do with over $10 million? I don't need more than $10 million. So if you uh, invest right and properly, make sure you take care of yourself in the future. Always look out for you in the future. And look out for things like, you got to be prepared. If you get divorced, uh, they could take half your money, bam, just like that. You know, So you got to prepare for yourself. Uh, yeah, and you got to, before you get married, you got to like a person. You, you can't love them. You got to like them first. You do. That fucking love can break off at any time. Yeah. When you like a person, then you always like them. So no. always protect yourself. Uh, but money is an amazing thing. So what I was saying, I'm teaching the young comedians, don't worry about being number one on top of the mountain. Just be on your way up the mountain. Just be on your way up the mountain. Everybody on top of the mountain, and thank God for those that are, but they had some problems up there. They had some luggage. Dr. King on top of the mountain. He caught hell. He got shot. Richard Pryor, drugs on top of the mountain. Prince, drugs on top of the mountain. Arthur Ashe, tennis player, on top of the mountain. Doesn't matter. You see all these people on top of the mountain. There's a lot of luggage to carry. You got to carry, and it get, uh, there's problems with it. But what, I'm in what, a what, what challenges do you feel like you've seen Jerry Seinfeld face? Because he's somebody that's been at the top of the mountain. Or do you feel like because he's a white comedian, he's might have had certain um, luxuries that maybe a, a black comedian uh, didn't have to face. Well, that's true, too, that a black comedian didn't have to face. First of all, if you have a Jewish name, you have way in. Let's just tell the truth. They own the business. Uh, Rodney Dangerfield did a joke 40 years ago, and I can say this because he actually said it. He was talking about everybody. He said, you notice I'm on the stage. No, it wasn't Rodney Dangerfield. It was, it was Dave Tyree, a black comedian down in Florida named Dave Tyree. Very funny at the comedy store, maybe in the 80s. He's a nasty man. He said, you notice I talk about every motherfucker in this room, but you didn't hear me say nothing about the Jews and the faggots, did you? Because they run this motherfucking business. And don't ever forget that they run this business. So Seinfeld with the name and also being smart, being smart. This guy, something is wrong with this guy. This is the cleanest guy. I can't, people, I can't get any dirt on him. And I live with him for... <laughs> He does everything right, Justin. Hmm. And he says, oh, when he got married, he says, he's not going to fool around anymore because it's not worth it. It's with the kids, you know, it's not worth it with the kids. 
He does everything. He's so meticulous about everything. So and your question was, what do, what do I think his method has been? Staying out of trouble. All he does is make money. He's almost a billionaire now. He's so, and I, now I'm starting to talk about his ass. He said, why are you talking about me? I don't like you talking about me. I said, shut the fuck up. I'm going like, <laughs> It, it, yes, and I go to the house just the way they eat. They're going, you know, these rich, rich ass white people, how they eat. They're Justin, so, you know what else they would do, Justin? I go to their house, they will order a pizza. They will order a pizza with just cheese on it. I'm going, what the fuck to me? <laughs> you can't give me no pizza with just cheese on it. I need some pepperoni and sausage. What the fuck is wrong with you people? Then they order one with broccoli. So they, I'm looking up like they don't understand the purpose of a pizza. It's supposed to be shit food. Eating shit food. So they were eating, and, and I just I watched them. They said, mm, oh, this is so good. This is so good. Oh my God, this is the best ever. It's so good. I know this little thing, so I wrote a joke about it. I said, black people, you go to our house, if we get something good to eat, it could be 3,000 people. If you get some good soul food and black people, we got one word. And the whole audience go, mm. Mm. that's all we got. Mm. If it's really good, you start shaking that knee. Mm. <laughs> so I watch things like that, watching him, uh, how rich he is, and uh, his house is so fucking big. When you're, when you're pressing the security code at the gate, Waze is still giving you direction to the house. <laughs> and 2,000 square feet, you want to reach your destination. So he said to me the other day, he says, you know, it actually does say that because he had changed his code and didn't know it. I said, I told you it said that. Ways the ladies said in 2000, his house is so big down on the ocean up in, in Long Island. And so I just make jokes about him. I don't know how I got into that subject. No, I, I asked you about it, the challenges and, oh. you know, you think you, this, this is, oh, oh, we about to wrap it up, man. I appreciate you um, sharing your time. Uh, I didn't do anything, but we can do it anytime. If somebody falls out, you can call me anytime. Okay? Man, hey, I appreciate that. Seriously, man. Seriously, oh, man. Because I, I can talk to you it, forever. I, I, if I didn't say it, because there's so much more we can talk about it. And I, I admire you. I respect you. And thank you so much for having me on. That's most important. Thank you for thinking of me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I always it's, have to say, I always have to finish with your punk ass. I always have to, <laughs> keep me humble. Uh, I'm my ass. Hey, Justin, somebody gonna whoop my ass one day. I'm always with your punk ass. Ain't yeah. nobody gonna fight you. Okay. You know, so that's so you said it earlier. You mentioned the way I had a smile on my face. You have an infectious energy about you. Um, and and I'm sure that's helped you along the way in your in your entire life. But there's something about your energy that makes makes the people around you happy. Um, and so, yeah, this, this last, thing I wanted to ask you two last questions. Um, one is what challenges do you feel like you personally experienced being a, a black comedian in the comedy circuit in, in Hollywood? You didn't ask the question, right? What you said, have my face in it, like even in the systemic racism. Mm. All my, like I said, I got into the comedy clubs when black comedians couldn't get into the comedy clubs because I was doing the Tonight Show and half my audience was black and white, you know? Uh, but that, that was a time they didn't want, even today they don't want too many, well, yes, they do. Uh, cause black comedians, that's who's filling the rooms now. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, first of all, they didn't want any blacks in there. So to make money, black people only want coming out. So you'll notice pretty much every comedy show, three weekends of the month is a black entertainer. Right. The white people don't come out anymore, but systemic racism has been there from day one. And you will see some of the shows and, at the clubs and maybe one black comedian on the stage with the, with the three, you know, uh, and, uh, with the three people and very few black headliners. That changed, thank God for Deaf Comedy Jam that brought that about and that changed. And then the black comedy clubs became popular. And there, are there any black comedy club owners right now? The only one I can think of is Ian's Mitchell that has the comedy union. Oh, okay, yeah, the comedy union. Now, can you believe that? Did you just say Ian's Mitchell? In, a, in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, right? The only comedy club owner in America. In America, right. In America. Now, what they do, they've gotten together. Now they got a group of white people, uh, club owners down in Georgia, North Carolina, and Florida. They let one guy do the booking now. Hmm. And so what's happened is that they got together, and so they can make more money. They got one guy that does the booking for all of the 20 clubs down in the South. 
they offer you money, not the money that you like, but if you don't work for them, you can't work for anybody else. Got a black guy tried to open up a club down in Jacksonville, Florida. If you go over there and work his club, you can't work to other clubs. Hmm. So some people got caught in a catch-22 situation where they had no choice because if you work for them, that's like, could be 45, 50 weeks of the year. But that's another systemic racism. They, they, they won't let the black comedians work the black clubs because they got their little mob there, okay? Systemic racism. When I left Las Vegas, I went to a, a hotel called the uh, South Point in Las Vegas, headlining, sold out! Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. I played lift every voice and sing before I walked out. And maybe two or three people said, what the fuck is this all about? Lift it. Way before Kavanaugh, lift every voice and sing. And I showed pictures of Dr. Martin Luther King and, and even the gospel singers. I showed pictures of people suffering in New Orleans when the storm went through like that. And, and somebody said, well, the white people feel a little, uh, what's the word for it? They didn't feel good or subjected about it, uh, a little racism there. And I said, I don't give a shit. That's what we went to, lift every voice and sing. This is a Negro National Anthem. But on my next contract, they said, we're going to go in a different direction. I got fired from that hotel, the South Point, just wow. because of playing the Negro National Anthem. So to experience this, uh, racism is still out there. They said, we're going to do better, but it's still out there. Bring a black uh, comedian, uh, it's tough. But we have to do what we have to do. Absolutely. Uh, and, and the last question is, man, what's next? You, what, what's next for you? Just doing stand up or, or you know? I never do everything else. I got a project in the works and I, and I hope we're going to get to it. I had an idea and I'm working with Norman Lear. Can you believe that? Legend. Norman Lear, 97 years old, good man, as nice as he can be. A year and a half ago, I wanted to reboot Sanford and Son because I said, okay, I'm going to do some TV. I went to him, he took my meeting. Now, how the hell would he take my, he knows me, he knew me, because I worked for many years ago. Uh, he said, why would you want to do Red Fox? Don't do him, do you? So we went back and thought of a project, and I said, okay. And a friend of mine, he has a kid, he was just talking about his kid, he has two kids, they're twins. And one kid is not transgender, but he is a alternate, I don't know what you call him, uh, a mixture, uh, trend. I Trans, transvestite, transgender. Trans, let's say transgender, okay? And the kid is like five, six years old, eight years old growing. He's a boy, but he wanted to be like his daughter, a girl. And so and I said, Dan, you still got to love that kid no matter what. He says, hey, absolutely, you got to love that kid no matter what, right? And we got into him, we started talking. Then we got into start talking about Orange is the New Black, Laverne Cox. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the light went off in my head. I want to do Sanford and Son. I got a kid that's a boy, 16 years old, leaves Mobile, Alabama, goes to New York, does his thing, comes back 31 years later, lock, knocks on my door. He said, Dad is me, is Edwin. Dad is me. Who? When we talk, I slammed the door in his face. He's transgendered now and to transition, huh? Uh huh. So the point is that me being an old black dad from the South, our right. job was to put food on the table and the mom took care of the kid. And the daddy doesn't know what the kids ran to. So your daddy would try to get the boy to play baseball and that's all, and he didn't do that. The daddy didn't see his point of view at all. So what has happened today and what happened 30 years ago is that me, the new daddy, Henry, I've got a lot to learn about living and letting people live their lives and educating America uh, on prejudices. So, nice. uh, so they're gonna come back and say, I even got, Every time I call him, her, or him, I got to put a dollar in the jar. So I got a lot to learn about having now the daughter. You have to say she. Uh, but I have to love this kid because he's my kid. And some people started to fight him, and I jumped in and go, hey! And then family, the family thing came out. And now we've had so many episodes that, like, I'm going to have her running for mayor of the city. No, the first thing I'm going to do is take her back to the church. And they're going to go, oh. I, know, I know Mr. Henry had a, had a daughter, and his best friend is directing the choir, so they know each other, and everybody's looking. So, you know, the black church is the worst place in the world for prejudice. Absolutely. Practices. There's a lot of homophobia so still in the black community. 
totally. So they got to get into involving this with everybody. I got to learn. You got to learn. It may not be homophobic sometimes. It could be dealing with drugs. It could be a lot of things people are dealing with in life that we have to, that we don't understand, that we got to reconcile and go, oh, people have problems. We got to live and let live. So that's the project, and everybody loves it. Should be on NBC. I'm nice. going to shoot it in Atlanta, and it's called Clean Slate. Everybody's starting over. Clean Love Slate. It. You be you, I be me, and it's going to be most important. It's going to just educate America. And so it's what, already picked up. Yeah, yeah, already picked up. Whew, that's a blessing. It is a blessing. God man, is good. God is great, man. Hey. Uh, Dr. Wallace, I appreciate you for being on Urban Legends. Like I said, man, I, I created this to celebrate living legends and people making legendary moves. You're, you're all of that and more. I just want to just let you know you're a king um, and c continue doing what you're doing, man, because you opening up those doors, make it easier for people like me to come through. And I and I stand on your shoulders. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And God bless you. Something good is going to happen to you, whether you like it or not. I'm George Wallace, and I always close by saying I love you, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And I just penned a new saying from George Wallace. Black at you. Black at you. I love it. Hey, man. Hey, this has been George Wallace, and this has been Urban Legends Podcast. Thank you, man. Right black at you. <laughs> Peace. Black at you. See ya. And watch me on Sybil on uh, YouTube, too. Sybil uh, Wilkes from the Tom Jordan Morning Show every Thursday, but I'm going to be on it with her and Jackie Reed tonight. YouTube at 7 o'clock uh, East Coast time, 6 o'clock Central, and 4 o'clock um, uh, Pacific Coast time. So we're doing that tonight. We do that every night, every Thursday night, Civil Wolves. And uh, we just have a lot of fun, and we talk about the issues of the day. And today we got to go with um, Judge uh, Ginsburg. Oh, we got problems, man. We got problems. Stay, and it's just like, that's what we got to get. Oh, yes, that's what we got to get these people to vote. You've got to vote. Do you know anybody that's not registered to vote? Everybody keeps saying uh, they're registered. I'm sure a lot of people not registered. They they be lying just to sound like they're not part of the problem. Yeah, but that one, that register, that one vote, your vote does matter. Just getting another person in office. Just think, Henry, uh, uh, Hillary could have won in Detroit, Michigan. The whole state of Michigan lost by 55,000 votes for Hillary Clinton. We had 755,000 people, no, 255,000 black people that did not vote. Mm. Right here in Georgia, Stacey Abrams, she could have won. Now we have, since she lost, we have additional 755,000 new registered voters. So we can change this world. And when we change the world and the system, it's not only about the president, it's about the Supreme Court justice. It's about all of these judgeships. Because these are the people you're gonna face, especially black people men face with police brutality now. We can change these things. We can change these laws. We can get in there and get our people in there. We can make Washington, D.C. a state. I'm getting ready to go crazy now. There's so many things we can do. We need to change the police, the brutality, and, and, and justice. Uh, I've never seen, as old as I am to this day, I'm still afraid of policemen when I see a policeman. I've never walked out of the house without seeing a policeman that I'm not afraid. They said there's some good cops out there. Well, I see some poor and they don't know them. You know, and I know they are, and I got people in my family. And then and, and, and I just, see, I've never seen, I, I'm going to have a problem just on, why do I have to get on the ground? What the fuck is with that? Here's my hand. Why do I have to, why you ever seen a, they don't put black people on, white people on the ground. Get on the ground. Last year, a lady and her four kids. Fearful, but I need to be some new training. We don't mean to defund the whole police system. We just mean to let's help it, change some thoughts and change some some uh, some uh, strategies. Because one strategy I think they need to change, Justin, is the target. When they shoot at the range, they shoot another black target. Hmm. Simple things like that. They don't give us a chance. They first they just come and shoot us, and then they think about it. So it's so much. You got to vote. We've got to change a lot of things. We've got to vote. And we'll talk about that the next time. Absolutely. Again. So, so we got into the voting thing. I forgot about that. Thank you, Justin Hires. Thank the you, brother. The man, the family, the fucking richest black family in America. A lot of y'all don't know this, but they own the root beer company, y'all. <laughs> they own the root beer company. I know his daddy. Hi. <laughs> yeah, my last name is Hires. It, it is a very famous uh, root beer. Uh, we not getting any of that money from that, that family. I need to find out who, <laughs> where they at. Systemic racism. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I used to say. Somebody was like, are you related? I'm like, yeah, their family used to own my family. So I, I mean- hey, wait a second, I, now. Don't get into that because now you're getting into the KFC. You know, ain't no way in hell uh, uh, 
uh, Colonel Sanders that made that chicken. That's some oh. bullshit. You know, no black ladies in the kitchen made that. That's some bullshit. Oh, absolutely. That's so your that's granddaddy it. definitely made the, the root beer because he's out there with those, working with those uh, uh, with herbs and he just drink this, you know, because we grew up down south. We used to make a lot of shit. Kool Aid. But first, see, Kool Aid is a derivative of the root beer. Okay, go ahead. I'll start talking <laughs> shit. Give up shit, man. <laughs> Uh, I'm a, I'm definitely having you back. Thank you for even saying that. So, I, you know, this this is just your first episode on here. So, I'm gonna have you back, man. I appreciate you, and uh, thanks thanks for doing this. God bless you. Okay. Stay to you. Atlanta. <laughs> Peace. Wakanda. <laughs>